Hey guys, welcome back to the Real Estate Investors Money Matrix podcast. I'm glad that you're joining me. I've had a three week break. I know you guys have missed me. Where have I been? But we've been putting the finishing touches on a home study course. It's this immersive 130 lesson, 500 page manual that details the eight best no cash, no credit investing strategies, literally known to mankind. Uh, at least I think so. Anyway, uh, very, very proud of it. Uh, and, and we've been really working hard, actually all of us uh, uh, almost 24 seven to really get this thing done and get it out to market because there's some tremendously valuable tidbits in there. Everything to run a real estate business, uh, not having to find uh, cash and or using your own credit, uh, contracts, scripts, where to find the leads. It's an A to Z, uh, fully immersive um, encyclopedia of how to do these types of deals. And that's one of the biggest challenges I find people have when they're starting out in real estate is they think that I either need a wholesale or do something else because I can't come up with the money. How do I buy these properties? You buy the properties by finding the right lead and by knowing how to tie them up with the right contracts. And you can actually own long-term property without ever having to pay cash for it today. And that's what this manual is all about. So guys, if, you have in, if you're interested in that course, click the link below here. Uh, we'll get you information, link you right to it, give you more description, and you can find out how you can get your hands on it. I got to tell you, I'm proud of it. I'm biased. It's really something special. Uh, you can go out and do deals immediately with this course. So click the link below if you have any interest in finding out more or if you want to get your hands on it, get you a digital course immediately in your inbox, literally immediately. Anyway, forgive my long-winded explanation and forgive my absence. I want to just let you know where I've been and what we've been up to. So uh, just interviewed a great guest, had a great conversation with Stuart Grazer. He's out in Colorado. They actually have a business in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. And what they do is they sell turnkey rental properties. Uh, he's active duty military, retiring here in just a few months after 20 years. So I thanked him for his service for sure. Um, but what they do is they find properties, they renovate them, they get them stabilized, or what that means is fully rented out and now generated cash flow. And they sell that lock, stock, and barrel to folks that want to be investing in real estate, but essentially want to be passive. And it's a great business for him. There's some great tidbits, some great takeaways. In fact, um, uh, Drew behind the camera was taken frantic notes because there were so many good takeaways and, and I had a couple myself. Hope you guys enjoy my interview with Stuart Grazer. Thanks guys. Guys, we are here with Stuart. Stuart, I want to say thank you very much for being my guest. I greatly appreciate your time and uh, very excited for this. Looking forward. Got lots of questions. Uh, I've got an interesting uh, company and, and really an amazing purpose and calling. And, and I actually read something the other day that, that in 2022, one of the keys to, to business going forward is, is not just being a business uh, that has a purpose, but really being a purpose or a mission company that, that actually has a company behind it that, that, that the purpose and mission was kind of leading. I, re I really like that. And of course, checking you guys out, that, that's really seems to be a big driver for, for what you guys do. So, so nice to meet you. Thank you for joining me. Honored to have you as my guest. Yeah, man. I, I really appreciate you guys reaching out and, and having me on. It's exciting to, uh, to jump on and and you know, share my story and, and uh, you know, learn more, more about you guys too. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I've got got uh, some some uh, good questions. At least I hope they're good questions. And uh, I find myself uh, uh, I'm curious, right? And I always I'm uh, interested in what drives people. What kind of uh, you know the mental as much as as you know what they're actually doing. You know, uh, morning routines and maybe books uh, that they've read or influences that that have made a difference in their life. So I'll probably give you some rapid fires at the very end uh, because I, I love hearing that and I find that we get some re really good uh, kind of uh, snippets from that as well. And people find that interesting, but also want to deep dive on the business that's that's one of the purposes of our podcast is to uh, hopefully provide an educational platform and uh, and and even though I enjoy the curiosity points I, uh, I know that folks out there that that, that we talk to that uh, that listen want to kind of see what they can learn from you so I'll probably ask some questions specific to the business some of the X's and O's and and uh, right this is a football right remember Vince Lombardi will start from the beginning but anyway uh, so that's kind of kind of what I foresee for this and so uh, having said that uh, I've got a, a basic introduction already for you but can you tell us a little about yourself and a little about your business and and uh personally and professional just give us a, a couple minutes on, on who you are yeah of course um well, i appreciate it so uh Stu grazier i um born and raised in, in texas and then um joined the navy right after high school i went to the naval academy did four years of college there and uh and then joined the navy and uh, flew helicopters uh, for 10 years um, mostly out in san diego California, and then um, transitioned and flew uh, Boeing 737s um, for, for a while. And I'm just finishing up that 20-year career in the Navy. I'm retiring in June. Um, and uh, But along the way, I've always been, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. 
Uh, I, I've always been interested in, in real estate and uh, I started doing, you know, just kind of dabbling in real estate uh, pretty much my entire naval career. Every time I'd move somewhere, we'd buy a new place, S tried every different niche of real estate, uh, failed a lot at a lot of them, lost a lot of money along the way, but you know, have been successful as, as well along the way too. And um, my business partner now, uh, we own a company called Storehouse 310 Ventures. Um, we were college roommates and he had also been buying real estate. And we both had a period of time where we were buying turnkey real estate. Uh, I had purchased some turnkey real estate while I was stationed over in Italy, um, and uh, it, it didn't go well. Um, and the, the properties I bought uh, were, were in bad neighborhoods. They were bad rehabs. They were bad tenants. They were bad management, and it just didn't go well. Um, all while I was living overseas, and it was, it was, it was a pretty big headache. Um, David, my business partner, also had purchased some turnkey real estate, uh, and it was even worse for him. It was to the fact, my point of like fraudulent and to, you know, he was going to be taking them to court for some of the stuff that they had done. Um, and those properties that he had purchased were in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He had a, he had family in Wisconsin. His, his uh, wife is from there. And so through that process, he had actually ended up having to essentially fire everybody that was a part of that uh, company that he had purchased from and he had to go find you know a new team he basically out of necessity had to go find a new team uh you know to contractors to realtors to property management to all the above and through that you know through adversity comes opportunity right and so um we we have always been talking and, and comparing notes and we're, we were best friends still our best friends um and we decided to kind of test out some more properties. So um, through this team that he had built, you know, they knew contractors, they were continuous, continually finding properties. So we decided to start buying some properties for ourselves and started to rehab them and turn them into rental properties. Um, along that, um, you know, we have a lot of friends in the military who are always interested in creating more opportunities for, you know, for investing and for creating passive income and cash flow. So we just started telling people, kind of our, our friends in the military about what we were doing. Um, and it kind of quickly turned into a business where we, you know, we're taking properties and rehabbing them and then selling them to, you know, people within our network. Um, you know, a lot of the people, at least in, in the Navy, all live uh, kind of on the coast, you know, so somewhat expensive markets, you know, San Diego, you know, Washington State, Washington, D.C., Virginia, they're all pretty expensive markets and some of them don't really cash flow very well, but stuff in the Midwest you know, in Milwaukee cash flows really well. So, um, you know, a lot of our friends and network got really excited about purchasing, you know, $100,000 properties that rent for $1,200 a month and, and have cash flow. And, and we brought a, a level of trust too, because of the, of the background in our military and, and also some background in our faith um, and how we kind of set up the business. So um, that's a long story to, to say now that we, you know, we have a, a turnkey real estate company based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and we provide, you know, single family homes, duplexes uh, that, uh, that cash flow and they're fully rehabbed, have property management in place. And um, yeah, we've been doing it for uh, almost four years now. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I'm taking some notes here. So first and foremost, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, that, that always needs to be recognized and congratulations on, on the uh, impending retirement. That, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's nice. I have a little taste, you know, I have, I have kind of a beard and some longer hair right now. I've, I, uh, I'm on a kind of a terminal leave status right now. So I'm, I'm kind of now finally free from the, uh, the rigors of, of military life. It feels pretty good to uh, kind of have that civilian uh, taste. It's good. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I bet. Yeah. So that's really, really great. And of course, 20 years. And so you're at a point where you have a pension coming in for life and, and all the benefits. Yeah come from that. I've had some friends do that. that that's, uh, that's great. And by the way, I've been to that military base in, in San Diego. Uh, it's on like the Island, right? Right. Over, yeah. Coronado uh, Island. Coronado. Yeah. I was, couldn't think of it when you're talking, but, but, but I've been there. Uh, yeah, it's, that's magnificent out there. And, and uh, so, and of course, understanding the cost of the coasts and, and how that would make it very difficult or more challenging to cash flow uh, certainly yeah. makes a lot of sense. So, all right, well, well, I guess several questions kind of in there. So um, uh, you said you tried a lot of different investing strategies and, and, um, um, I guess I'm curious to know some of those and, and then ultimately somebody that has done it. And, and I guess because of your schedule and being a full time active military, um, finding the properties, renovating, going through the process of essentially making them or converting them into a turnkey. 
um, it's, that's interesting. You kind of went from, it sounds like some, some challenges to saying, look, we're going to just go all the way and, and buy them turnkey. I'm, I guess I'm interested why you didn't want to just buy them, fix them up, renovate them yourself, uh, and then obviously get them stabilized. Maybe that was part of the process that led you to ultimately wanting to buy turnkey. Can you, can you tell me a little about what you did prior, some of the strategies that you had some challenges with, or uh, as you say, fail that and, and probably learned a lot of really yeah. valuable lessons through that process. That's how we all learn. And then how did you ultimately decide you want to just start buying them turnkey as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, early on in my military career, uh, I was flying helicopters. I was, you know, training a lot, flying a lot, being deployed. Um, and in my mind, I didn't feel uh, I really had the time, so to speak, to to be rehabbing properties, to build out a team, um, you know, to, to do some of the requirements that are necessary that, that require time um, to, to put into uh, investing in some of those types of, of assets and that, those niches. So I actually, the, my first uh, kind of niche in investing was private lending. And, and I know like that's kind of opposite of a lot of investors. A lot of investors kind of end up doing private lending once they have a lot of cash. But, you know, I'd go on a deployment, I'd save a lot of money, I'd leave, live below my means, and then I, I would lend that money out for just a very passive return. And so at first, while I was very busy in the military and, and flying and deploying all the time, I was really looking for just passive strategies where I could just build up some, some capital, deploy that capital, and then wait for a return. And so, um, you know, I, I, had, tr I had done the private lending, I purchased uh, long term, you know, uh, prom like mortgage notes, you know, I kind of started learning that business and doing just buying long term 30 year fixed rate mortgage notes um, on, on the, the secondary market, um, buying second position notes and kind of figured out that lending world that that mortgage note world. And so that was kind of my first um, stage of investing. Uh, soon enough, I, I ran out of capital. So I had to kind of figure out, you know, other ways. Also, I figured out that that wasn't very, uh, you know, just buying them in my personal name or in an LLC that wasn't very uh, tax advantageous. So I started getting a large tax bill every single year. Um, so I started figuring out, I started well, like, whenever. yeah, I was like, all right, well, what do I need to do to offset some of these taxes? And my CPO was like, well, you got to start buying some more properties. Well, at the time I was living in Italy and I was like, ah, I can't do this full, th you know, find a market, find a realtor, do it all myself. So I went the turnkey, you know, way, um, which is why I burnt by purchase some turnkey properties myself. You know, I, I, again, I built up some more capital and instead of continuing to do the, the lending and the, and the mortgage note stuff, you know, my CPO was like, well, you need to get some actual assets to kind of offset some of those taxes. So that's what I did. And, and I, I did very little research. You know, it was from like one referral saying that this was a good company. Um, and, and I ended up purchasing some, some properties in an area I knew nothing about. Um, and, you know, all from overseas in Italy. And, um, you know, so really bad on me for, for not doing more research and, and digging into all that. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of why I went that direction. Yeah. You makes know, perfect very, sense. Looking for a passive type of investing at first. Sure. And of course, a very encompassing, you know, job that, that takes you all over the world, uh, obviously yeah. in Italy and, and I'm sure a lot of other places. So, yeah, and I think that's probably most people's biggest challenge, uh, uh, it, especially nowadays, although they, 50 years ago, I'm sure they said the same thing, but it's just lack of time. And, and, yeah. and so, uh, so to, to, to end up at the turnkey, you know, fairly early on uh, certainly makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like you didn't have the best experience uh, with, with the turnkey at first. Can you share a little about what, what that looked like and, and uh, uh, what, what not the best experience means. Yeah. So for me, you know, again, um, I did very little research on the market. Um, I did very little research on, on the, the, the team itself, the property management company. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think the, the team itself is incredibly important to do some research on who that team is, their background, if, if they have the same core values, um, you know, what, what they see as successful and, and what you see as successful might be very two different things. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the market itself, uh, you know, for me, I just, again, like heard somebody say that this was a good market and this was a, a decent team, but um, you know, a lot of referrals, they get money for referring. Um, so maybe they not, might not have the best intentions at heart. And so for me, like, I just kind of took everything, um, you know, word of mouth and, and jumped into it. I'm kind of a, an action taker. I, I kind of, you know, take action without doing all the research that I should. And so that, that was probably a mistake, not probably, it was a mistake, but you know, the, the, 
the properties themselves, they said that they were in C-class neighborhoods. Well, they were probably in D-class neighborhoods. The tenants, you know, every single turnover was a huge, you know, essentially another another rehab because mm. they took terrible care of the place. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, capital expenditure type maintenance that I had to do pretty quickly after purchasing the properties where typically, you know, a turnkey property you would expect and I have to put a roof on it, you know, a year later. Um, and so all that was done without very little research and without very little knowledge of what even to ask to begin with. So, you know, just, just lots of kind of poor things going wrong with, with rental properties. Sure. Kind of, kind of sounds like the, the ready fire aim approach uh, exactly. get out there and shoot it and then, then figure it out. And yeah, that'll... yeah. I mean, and there's, there's, there's some greatness to, to take an action, um, mm -hmm. but, but take an action blind, um, probably not the best of best of things. Yeah, but that's a great point though, because I'm sure you see it in your world as well. You, you, a lot of people have uh, have great intentions, and 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 many have great potential. And as we say every once in a while, potential is the worst thing that happens to a lot of people, right? Uh, but it's those that that take action and 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 stop, you know, thinking about it so much. And you're ready, fire aim. You get the others that are kind of the analysis of paralysis and and find every hole that they can poke and every reason not to do the deal. And and it sounds like you're you're more 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 the opposite of that. They're looking for reasons to find the deal. And I'll say this, you know, the research on the people is, is interesting because. Because I find myself just habitually when I go to a website, I'm most curious to just check out who the people are. And sometimes you kind of feel a connection and, and, and sometimes you don't. So, so it sounds like there's some really good takeaways uh, right up front. And, and I actually have a couple questions regarding kind of the metrics that you look at when you're evaluating a property and the, the yield and cash flow that you're, I guess, looking to really generate. So, um, and so, um, and by the way, I will say this before I forget, uh, I always, the, we've got, I'm in Jacksonville, Florida, and we have two military bases here. And, and so we've had a chance to, to befriend a lot lot of military folks and and uh, uh, we also have some f partners that we work with that when they went to uh, d were deployed in different uh, parts of the country they would would buy a house and and uh, and they would keep it and they'd go to the next place and and one gentleman that that is I, I since retired but I think he picked up 12 sometimes something like that properties and next thing you know you know the, each of them were worth you know upwards of a million bucks and and you know and and it was never intended to be as such so so for any military folks watching that's what I always say to the ones that, that, that I get a chance to talk to, you know, buy it, figure out how to keep it. So, you know, you can either, uh, you know, use your VA again and, or somehow keep it within your debt to income. So you qualify for another, but I think it's one of those decisions that you make early on that can really, really benefit you for, for a long time to come. So, all right. So doing re remote investing, obviously today is, 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 uh, is, is certainly second, secondary at this point. What do you look for? Um, I guess, what would the advice be if there were t three things that you would say, someone's wanting to get involved into, they want to buy turnkey, they're busy, they, they, they want to be uh, uh, effectively a passive real estate investor. Um, what are the, what are the, maybe the top three things that you give as far as advice for those looking to turn, to get into turnkey real estate? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would, I would ask, um, I would really dig into, to who the people are, right? So you want to know what their core values are. And I would, I would straight up ask them like, Hey, what are your core values? And if, if uh, they don't have a pretty good response pretty quickly, then you kind of probably know that that they haven't really thought about that. Um, and I would always back that up with a question of like, well, explain to me those core values and how you how do you show those core values, right? Um, and and then obviously you kind of want to know what their experience is, uh, what their what their knowledge is, um, and you know ask for referrals. Now they're probably going to give you referrals from people that have had success. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, I kind of I regret, you know, a lot of times um, a turnkey company will will ask for a a ref, like a, a referral on their website or referral on bigger pockets or Google or whatever. They ask for that immediately after you close. Mm -hmm. Well, everything at closing is great, right? right. So you haven't had the experience. It's, it's the yet. year, yeah. It's the year later. Um, is that, is that investment still good? And so, you know, that's what I would really ask is, all right, Hey, can you, can you give me a referral? And if you talk to that referral, well, how long have you owned these properties? How, how long ha has this been good for you? You know, are you, have you owned these for one year, two year, five years? You know, talk, you want to talk to the person who's been investing with this company for five years, multiple times over, have they purchased more properties than just the one? 
Um, that, that's a really questions. good way. Yeah. Great questions, because yeah, then that, that, people just at a surface glance wouldn't wouldn't uh, know that the, the the review was given. You know, immediately following closing. You know, is that person a multi multiple buyer? Is it has the experience continue to be positive? Have they ended up having to replace a roof a year later or have properties yeah. in, in the world? That that is a, a great great t t tidbit there. Uh, to look look a little bit behind behind the curtain. And by the way, I I, uh, uh, I cut my teeth in war zones. I come from a, a real estate family, and my dad was. Uh, very poor, both he and my mom when I was born, he read a book and, and ultimately he came from the inner city and had a mentality that kind of kept him there, which is really uh, interesting psychology, kind of never felt he could do bigger and better properties, at least for a period of time. And, and so yeah. when I joined him out of college, um, um, as I said, I cut my, my teeth and realized quickly that those weren't areas I wanted to operate in. You know, I was was taught early on, and it's kind of a joke today that when you knock on the door to, to collect the rent, you stand off to the side just in case they decide to shoot you. So um, yeah. Yeah, I realized pretty quickly <laughs> that those, those weren't areas that I wanted to be uh, operating in. So, and and the, the issue, of course, is, is it sounds like you might have experienced is when they're a D-class property. Property, um, what happens when you want to exit the deal? You know, who's your buyer and, and is the value, yeah. is it just maintaining? Is it appreciating? And so, um, but but you got caught in a situation like that. And I suspect that if people aren't, if they're going in blind, not asking the right questions, that, that could certainly, you know, happen happen to them as well. Buying properties in areas that on paper may look like the cash flow, but the the tangible yeah. Uh, goods at the end of the day are not not what they'd be uh, would be hoping for i'm sure well and there's another there's another point that you kind of bring up as far as it looking good on paper you know a, a lot of companies will you know you can make the numbers look however you want the numbers to look right and there's a lot of there's a lot of you know tweaks of numbers when when they're sending you a pro forma you know pro forma, pro formas always lie like they're they're never truthful right um and so you know if you're if they're telling you things like uh, there will be no maintenance. Like you don't need to save for maintenance because we just rehabbed it. Well, that's, mm. I mean, all houses have problems regardless of if you just did a rehab. Um, so if they're not putting those into your numbers and if, if they're, you know, if they're kind of putting some uh, depreciate, like if they're using depreciation as possibly a, an addition to cash on cash return and stuff like that, mm. like just, just know what the, the, the numbers really mean, you know, looking at that stuff and, and saying like, all right, well, does this really make sense? Yeah. Um, you know, cause ask a lot of people will kind of fudge those numbers. Yeah. Ask the, don't, don't be bashful in asking the questions. And yeah, I, I learned a long time ago, pro forma basically means this is our best guess as, as to how we think things are going to go right. No guarantee right. behind it. So if you take it as gospel, it's uh, you, you, you're probably uh, going to find it's not entirely true. So, okay. So uh, you, you gave me the first piece of advice, uh, two other things that you would be looking for, uh, for potential, uh, you know, clients that are looking to buy turnkey. Um, so clients, clients of ours. Well, just, I think in general, so I'm sorry, someone trying to looking to get into it. You'd said the first thing you say is kind of check out the team experience and, and really great nugget. Make sure that the reviews are not just today, but, but, you know, ongoing to see what the long-term, you know, the relationship has looked like. Are there any other things that, that you would give as far as advice is concerned for someone that just wants to buy a turnkey property? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, you know, there, there are lots of, there are lots of good markets out there for, for rental properties. Um, and just, I don't think necessarily knowing all the statistics and the data of the market, but, you know, maybe digging in a little bit, you know, I would say, go, go see the market, right. You know, it, and, and understand where those houses are, because if you're looking at Google maps, or even if you're looking at, you know, city data or, or, or you know, websites online, there's nothing like actually going to to the town, walking the neighborhoods and walking them at night and kind of figuring out like, is this an area that you really want to be investing in and, and go drive around and see if there's, you know, new buildings going up, seeing if there's development, seeing if it's if it's in a growth area or if you're going to be in the slums and you don't want to be walking around at night because you think you're going to get shot. Like those are the things that I would highly recommend and go and go see the team, like go actually go visit the team, go, you know, ask if you can come see their headquarters and see what they're doing and talk to property management and just now really dig in before you just you go on and, and buy some something. Yeah. And, and how, how simple and, and how, how minimal of a cost, uh, not only 
monetarily, but but time to fly in, to 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 drive the neighborhood, to to meet the team, to really get a feel. Yeah. Ultimately, these are our six figure investments, and 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 then 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 on uh, to to not take that time up front just seems uh, seems foolish, frankly, to to not do that. So, okay, so what's is there a, is there a minimum cash flow? Um, kind of keep it simple, silly. Is there just a minimum cash flow that you you strive for when you're when you're looking to buy a, a, a long term property? Yeah, so I'm looking for at least 10% cash on cash return is is what uh, you know I'm looking for personally for my own investments, and so that's that's what we would offer um, to any investor that's buying a property from us. At 10% cash on cash return, um, we like to see it a minimum of $200 um, of of positive cash flow or cash flow at, you know on a single family home, and that's including all all of the expenses. We you know we have the property management expense in there. We have savings for, for maintenance. We have savings for capital expenditures down the line if you're going to hold this long enough. We have savings for vacancy, um, insurance tax, all that kind of stuff. Like at, at the end of the day, bottom line number is, is $200 per door of cash flow and a 10% cash on cash return. Fantastic. So, and my next question was kind of walk me through just an example and you, you kind of, I'd like to just ask you to do that one more time. Maybe. Yeah. So, so someone says to you, this is something we think we want to hold for a long period of time. The roof, it doesn't, it's not leaking, may not even have any waves, but we know it's 10 years old already, may have five, may have 10 years left. You actually have an allocation today in, in the, 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 the monthly yield for long-term repairs. That's interesting. So you'd actually, so someone buying a house that doesn't need that may actually have a better return because they wouldn't have to, to plan for that. Uh, that's interesting. So, so can you just kind of give, give me a, give me kind of a rundown of, 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 uh, of what that looks like. How do you come up with the 10%, I guess, is the root question. Yeah, of course. Um, so what, what we do as a part of um, our, our rehab, when we go and walk a property, you know, this, this is a gray area. You can't, truly determine how long, you know, an HVAC system is going to run or a roof is going to last. But, you know, our contractors are pretty knowledgeable on this stuff. And, and when, when they go and walk a property, you know, if they think that there's going to be uh, no less than 10 years of a lifespan on any major system, you know, the roof, the HVAC, the plumbing, the water heater, any of that stuff, those capital, large capital expenditure type items, we're going to replace it. So our goal is to make sure all capital expenditure items that have a minimum of a 10 year lifespan. Um, so that, that kind of starts out. Um, but we, we tell people in our pro forma, like you still need to be saving for those long-term expenditures down the road. If you plan on holding this thing for 30 years. So in our pro forma, um, we have an 8% property management fee, cause that's what our property manager manager uses. Um, we have a 5% savings for just regular monthly maintenance items. And th these are all uh, percentages of the rental income, uh, 5% for capital expenditure savings. Uh, we have a 7% vacancy rate because that's about what the average is in this in that city. Um, and then what else? Uh, obviously, the, the property taxes and insurance and the mortgage, all that kind of stuff um, we put in there. And um, I think that's about it. And that's, you know, income minus all those expenses will get us that, that uh, minimum of a 10% cash on cash return. Very good, very good. And so, um, go back to the, the the military days when you guys kind of started doing it for for your your peers. Um, obviously, you have to make a profit, right? And and uh, you know you don't you, you as much as uh, uh, you guys are mission driven. You, you know you don't like to work for free. I assume nobody does. So uh, I have found in in my world when I'm uh, pricing you know a profit in there for for myself, um, I've had people trip over the fact that we're making what they would deem maybe too much money or or whatever the, the perception is. So um, uh, how did you, how did you end up profiting, I guess, in your earlier days? Uh, and, and I get, and I don't want to ask for your secret sauce, nor do I want to put you out there for potential clients that say, Oh, that's how those guys do it. But I think that there's a curiosity to me because I, because I have, I was telling Andrew before we, we started, home, I have a curveball. I don't know if it's really a curveball, but, but, but I have a, a question that that's always, um, I guess, um, I don't want to say puzzled me, but, but if I were doing what you do, there'd be one tweak I, I, I would want to implement. I'll, I'll share that in a second, but how do you, uh, uh, how do you, I guess, make money at the end of the day without telling too much of your your secrets? Because that, to me, is is uh, I'm I'm curious uh, on how you guys end up profiting and how you did from your early days to today. Yeah, so I mean, I would say almost every single house that we buy is an off market deal. Um, so you know, we we make money on the buy. Sure. Um, so you know, we're buying the house that needs a ton of repairs, yep. and uh, you know, we're buying it forty cents on the dollar, fifty cents on the dollar. And then, you know, we have a great team of, of contractors, you know, we're buying in bulk for all of our materials, you know, so we kind of have a warehouse where we can store stuff so we can kind of buy bulk discounts. 
And so, I mean, our profit is basically just the difference between our purchase and rehab and, and our sale, you know, sure. we just make the difference in between. And uh, sometimes we, you know, make a decent amount of money. Uh, sometimes we lose money depending on how the rehab goes, or sometimes yeah. we barely break even um, because, you know, we have a lot of overhead too. We have some employees, you know, we have operations costs, um, et cetera. So um, it, at the end of the day, really, that's, just, I mean, there's no secret sauce. It's just, yeah, gotcha. we, we buy low rehab and we sell it for after repair value. Just, I mean, essentially it's a flip, right? Yeah. And absolutely. we just make sure it's a good rental too. With a built-in buyer uh, waiting for you, or at least to, to some degree. So, yeah. And I think um, uh, I learned a long time ago, you make your money in the buy. Uh, that is you, yeah. you, you buy your equity by, by taking on the risk and, and certainly the, the um, process of renovating, um, you're creating value and, and ultimately in, enhancing the, 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 the spread. And, and that's how you, you get paid for your knowledge. And obviously you, you guys doing the legwork there. So uh, that's fantastic. And obviously the better buy you make, you know, you sell it at, a, at an ARV after repair value. So you sell it at a market value. That's what's expected for, for the turnkey type buyers. And, and, um, yeah, so the better buy the, the, uh, the, the better profit, where do you guys find, you said off market, um, may I ask where you guys do lead generating? What do you have any, any kind of, uh, rules of thumb that you share that, that, you know, these are, I guess, what's your number one driver for finding good opportunities? Yeah. The number one driver for finding opportunities is people. Um, you know, we, we have made it a real goal of, of creating relationships, uh, in, in the market that we're in. Um, and, and basically telling everybody in that market that we're buying and give us, give them our buy box. So, Love it. you know, we actually don't do a whole lot of uh, direct marketing, um, you know, to, to the, the, the direct seller. Uh, we don't do direct mail. We don't do text message, cold calling campaigns. We tried it. We weren't very good at it and it cost us a lot of money. Um, so we just stopped. Um, so, you know, we're on about every single wholesaler buyer list that we possibly could be on. We're a part of every like, Facebook group, you know, in that market, uh, you know, we know lots of, uh, realtors, um, you know, we're engaged on bigger pockets, we're engaged in forums. Um, and so really it's just about creating relationships yeah. and, and, you know, doing well by them. You know, we want to have our wholesalers make money. We want to have our realtors make money. Um, they know what we're looking for. And when they have a deal, they send it to us because they know we'll buy it and we'll close. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. My dad used to say, uh, tell the world what you do. Um, no matter where you go, tell them what you do. You want to always give value uh, and, and treat people well and, and make sure you have repeat customers. But but you've got to let everybody know what you do. So you just exemplify that Facebook groups and, 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 and podcast forums. Here you are with us and and and, you know, getting out there and letting, letting people know what you do is 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 part of part of that and be proud of it and be proud of yourself and, and ultimately treat people well and, and they'll, they'll keep coming back to you. So uh, the very, very good stuff. I got to tell you. Uh, um, uh, very, very good details, and and uh, and uh, certainly appreciate you sharing as, as openly as you have. Um, and so I'm trying to think if I have any other questions uh, on the turnkey. Let me throw you that 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 it's not a curve. I don't want to set it up as such, but um, but um, uh, yeah. So well, let me kind of tell you where it comes from. Uh, there, there's a, a guy named Ron Legrand. A lot of people in our space have heard of Ron. Have you have you, you know who Ron is? Yep. He's um, as f fondly known as the godfather of real estate. Andrew's laughing at me here, uh, but uh, I worked for Ron for a few years. Actually, ran his real estate operation, and, and oh, very uh, cool. Yeah. And so uh, I was with him uh, just a few weeks ago and there's a local turnkey company here in Jacksonville uh, who've been around for a while and, and, and they've done a good job of, of promoting themselves and, and establishing what I would say is a very positive reputation. And and uh, and I said, you know, I, I never really the, the turnkeys are great, but I feel like if you're the, the guy that's doing the work, uh, i.e. Stewart here, uh, you know, you're creating this this um, this flip, this opportunity, getting paid for it. Um, and as is common in many businesses, you have to once you sell you have to go do it again. And that's part of the sales business. But it feels like you're doing a lot of the work and giving the long term or selling the long term to, to somebody else. And, and he said to me, he said, you know, I don't know why those guys just don't say that we're going to take 10% of every deal at the back end. And uh, he said they wouldn't miss a beat. People would still buy it. They just would know that, that at the end of the day, when they decide to sell, there's, there's a 10% cut to the to the turnkey boys. And so anyway, I don't think that's a curveball, but, but that, that's something that is interesting to me because, again, you guys, uh, you do what you do. You do a great job at it, clearly, and, and congratulations for the success. Uh, but do you feel you're giving away the long-term equity uh, and, and I guess I'm, I'm trying to load the question the right way. If that's how you felt, you wouldn't do that. But uh, what are your thoughts, I guess, on, on that as a potential tweak to the business, if that makes any sense at all? And this is, I guess, more of a curiosity point. Oh, man. It's, I mean, it's, I, I love it. It's a great idea. And honestly, I've never really even thought about it. So you're saying 
almost you kind of make a contract with, with that buyer that, Hey, if you ever do sell it in the future, we'd like 10% of that profit because it's going to grow in value over time. You retain 10% ownership and every, every, every deal that you put together yeah. is just part of what is a condition of what you do. And Hey, yeah. listen, your business may flatline if you do that. Right. But, uh, yeah. but I thought it was an interesting suggestion that, but yeah, that would be it. It would be, be some sort of condition of the contract. Yeah, no, it's, I, I really like it. Um, I, I know a lot of um, turnkey providers uh, where they, where they really make their money, um, on, on the long term is for that passive income is on the property management side. You know, is if they, so they also, they have the, the flipping turnkey company, but then they also do the property management too. So, you know, as they sell these houses off, they're going to continue to get profits on the property management side of the business as they manage those properties. Uh, we didn't do that because one, we didn't have the capacity because we were still, you know, active duty military. We didn't have the capacity to build another company and build that out. And so we just, you know, and we didn't really want to be property managers. I was, I was trying to um, trying to save that for the end, man. But who wants to yeah. be a property manager? What a yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but I think that is another profit stream that you can create as a turnkey provider. Um, you know, what we ended up doing was essentially kind of partnering with a property management company that we really liked that that manage our own properties. Um, and, you know, you get somewhat of like a, a referral fee, if you will, sure. uh, for, for bringing more properties, but we would never do that if we don't believe in them, trust them and, sure. and we use them ourselves. So um, we, sure. we highly, um, uh, you know, love what they do. Sure. And uh, but I, I, I do like that, that idea and that model. Well, you can send me a check if you like. No, just kidding. Uh, but, but but part part of uh, just so for, for clarification, property managers do require licenses. So so uh, I'm not aware of any state where they don't. So I think anybody listening to to just tie that down that it's not an option just to be a property manager. You actually would have to be be licensed to do so. And so. All right. Very good. Well, man, I really appreciate you sharing. Um, I have a couple of just personal questions, if I may. Um, and uh, and uh, um, so uh, where did the name come from? Storehouse 310? I think I know, but where did it come from? Yeah. So we, we put a lot uh, of our faith background in our company. Um, Storehouse 310 comes from a verse in the Bible, Malachi 310. Uh, which says, bring a tithe to the storehouse. And the Lord says, test me in this and see if I will not open up the floodgates of heaven. Um, so as a part of our business model, the first 10% of all of our profits go to a uh, charity that we support. Um, we, we right now are currently supporting um, a, a nonprofit organization called the Exodus Road. They're in Colorado Springs and uh, they fight human trafficking uh, around the world. And they're an amazing organization. And um, so, yeah, so 10% of our profits go immediately to, to charity. Um, and uh, so that's where Storehouse 310 comes from. Love it. Here's a Bible quiz. Are there any other parts in the Bible where God says, test me? Um, man, I don't think so. There's not. Yeah, I just heard this in a yeah. sermon the other day. So act like I'm over here a Bible scholar, right? Yeah, I don't I think so. That, that's one of my, well, I, I'm very familiar with that verse. And and yeah, my, my the uh, the sermon I heard said that's the only only place. So you want to talk about a powerful scripture, right? Yeah. The only place in the Bible that God says, hey, test me on this, see if I'm if I'm making it up. And so, and and I don't, I won't go too far down the path, but but what I can tell you is that uh, tithing and giving back um, is if you understand, if you believe the Bible, it's, uh, it's part of what you're supposed to do. And, and, uh, yeah. and, uh, I read a book one time called seed faith by oral Roberts. I remember oral mm. Roberts university and yep. it was given to me by, by actually one of my, my private investors, somebody actually helped me start my company today. And, uh, it's one of those things that it's one of the first things people cut out of their life when, when times get tough. And what this book says is it should be the last thing you cut out because when you, yeah. you let go of what's in your hand, God, let's go what's in his and, and I'll, I'll keep it there. I won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but yeah. I connect with what you're saying. I connect with what yeah. you're saying. So Thanks very so cool. Uh, only other question, and then I'm going to rapid fire is, do you find sharing your faith in a workplace or in a business setting um, is challenging? And if so, uh, why? Um, so I, I don't think it's challenging. Okay. I think, I think uh, it, it opens up a, a lot of opportunities to have great conversations and um, I'll tell you the more conversations I have with people who initially uh, wanted to have a call to talk about real estate ends up, we having calls about other things. And a lot of those other things are, are faith related questions and, and, and discussions. Um, so I think being open about it is, is just a part of our ministry. I think you can really use business to be a part of your ministry. Um, and, and, you know, that's absolutely what, what our goal is. You know, we, we started the business just thinking that, Hey, we were just going to give money away because that's what we believe in. Um, but what I think it's done has, has really opened up doors to a lot of other things and, and having, um, discussions and, and, 
you know, business opportunities, giving opportunities, and a whole lot of other stuff that's really cool if, if you just be open and honest and share share your faith. Fantastic. All right. Three rapid fires. Number one, right. do you have a morning routine? I do. Yeah. Um, I, I pretty much follow uh, the, the Miracle Morning, the How Elrod. Uh, the, the savers plan, you know, the, 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 the silence, the affirmations, the visualization, um, what it's the other one, uh, reading, scribing and exercise. Yeah. And that's, so I, I do that pretty much every morning. I'm, I'm an early morning guy. I'm typically up between four and 5. AM. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That, 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 I thought I was, <laughs> that comes from the military days. Yeah. My goodness. What time you go to bed? Uh, eight or nine. Yeah. Okay. I would say nine is about my, my, uh, my lights out um, you know, I'm crashing. Yeah. All, all have us die hard, huh? That's right. <laughs> 20 years of that, right? It's a, yeah, that'll be ingrained. Yeah. All right. Uh, favorite book that you recommend that that's had an influence on your life. Uh, my favorite book that's had a pretty big impact besides the Bible. Um, there's a book called life and air. Uh, it's by hmm. Steve cook. Um, that, that had a, a really big impact on the way I think, uh, about what's most important, uh, in our lives. Interesting. I've not heard of that. I'll have to check that out. That uh, uh, that sounds very. Yeah, it's kind of a, a play on words of you know instead of being a millionaire, you're a life and heir, and and putting you know life uh, more important than than uh, money and business and um, yeah, it's, it's good. Man, really that's really good. It. Yeah. What is it to, to gain the whole world but lose your soul? Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's got to be some balance in there. So, and fi final question is um, uh, one influential person in your life that uh, that shared a lesson with you and maybe a life lesson that you've shared that um, condensed, of course, but, but, um, but is there a life lesson that, 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 that you, when people, I guess um, that just comes to mind, I guess that, that, that has, has had a big shape, shape in how you've turned out and, and maybe you, um, uh, you know, can tie some of just how you think today, some of your life philosophy back to. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if I can direct this to, to one person, so to speak, but, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of influencers, uh, in the space, um, you know, talk about this a lot and, and I didn't really buy into this for quite a while, but it's just, it's just really surrounding yourself around the people that, that you, that share the same values and that will, that will lift you up and, um, also, you know, lift you up, but also are looking to, to grow as well, you know, so getting into things like a mastermind group um, and, and putting yourself in the room with other people that are like-minded that, that want to grow with you and, and help you along the way. Um, that's incredibly powerful. And, and I didn't, I didn't start, you know, looking into that and being a part of like small groups and masterminds for a long time. I tried to do everything on my own. Um, and I think that's, that's really where I, I started to, to, uh, blossom and, and really grow was when I started putting myself in rooms with other people uh, in mastermind groups and, and, you know, church small groups and that kind of stuff where, where you can really pour into people and have them pour back into you. Yeah, boy, that's so good. Yeah, we did a, had a mastermind here last year that was uh, phenomenal, and we had some just tremendous feedback. And and uh, yeah, it's uh, um, trying to to surround yourself by the right people is so critical. If you're hanging around a bunch of broke people uh, and you want to be a millionaire, that that's that's probably going to be uh, you know a, a tough road uh, just because uh, of the the people that are kind of in your uh, sphere of influence. So, well, Stuart, man, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the candor. Uh, you've you've been awesome. I've really I've gotten some really good takeaways myself here that. Uh, uh, that I look forward to kind of putting in play here. So I want to say a big, big thank you again for your time. Uh, I hope our paths get to cross soon. I've got a couple of things I'll share with you once we're done here, but, but, uh, but really, really enjoyed it. So thank you for being my guest, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks Scott. I really appreciate you having me on. This was fun. Fantastic. So, all right, guys, that's another episode of the real estate investors money matrix. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I look forward to seeing you guys really soon. Thank you. I see you've been watching our videos and I want to give you a big thank you. If you've ever wanted to get into real estate investing, there's never been a better time than now. Click the link below for more information on how you can work with myself and my team or visit pinkaffiliates.com. That's pinkaffiliates.com. We have a variety of options for you to get started at whatever level you are interested in. Click the link below, visit pinkaffiliates.com and see what Pink can do for you. Okay.